Hey, Rudy. Hey, hey. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and uh, and uh, get started. You know, as, as always, if you guys have, uh, uh, hey, there's Eddie. Uh, it, uh, top of the top of the day there, Mr. Eddie. If if you uh, if you have any questions during our our session, you know, feel free to uh, unmute and ask your question. Or if you want to put your question in the chat, that's uh, okie dokie also. All righty. Well, let's just go ahead and uh, and get started. Yeah, uh, let's let's do that. It's two oh one. I know we've got a, a good full hour. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jonathan Bricker, and I'm the chairman of the Arkansas District Export Council. And uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. You guys made it. This is the uh, the last episode of a six part series, um, and it's one that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, sleep. You're like, wait a minute, this isn't about sleep, it's about money. <laughs> well, you're, you're right. I sleep better knowing that I'm going to get paid after I ship my products. <laughs> so that's really what we're going to be talking about today is getting you a good night's sleep. There's uh, there's some new faces on here on the chat. So real quick, for those of you that, that aren't quite sure what the District Export Council is, uh, we're a private nonprofit organization that brings together experienced international business people with potential exporters. Uh, each council member has been appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for their real-world expertise in international trade. Um, and we'll start today again by, by thanking our sponsors. Um, these six-part series couldn't be done without the, the partnership of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions. So thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, your support on that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Rudy, which, you know, he's been our, our moderator for all six series and, and obviously all of our educational uh, webinars. He is the District Export Council's education chair, but um, had recently retired from the Economic Development Commission. He is now the owner of his own business, Strategic Business Services, yep. um, and he can help in a wide variety of exporting needs. Um, so anyway, Rudy, you've done an amazing job with this, and uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Let me see. Can we go ahead and uh, go to the next slide? So uh, most of you have been on for the six part series. And obviously this is the last one. Uh, as you can see there, these are the classes that were part of the grow your exports schedule and getting ready to export, developing customer relationships on and on and on. And today is the last of the six, uh, six part series. Now, having said that we put on 14, 15 uh, or so classes a year uh, but this this uh, series of classes are really things that you uh, that everyone who's going to be exporting needs to know and be aware of. You know the old saying about you know you don't know what you don't know, and uh, that's when you wind up making uh, fairly expensive mistakes. And so these are the the things that we that we cover to make sure that you do know that it is on your radar that uh, you pay you have to pay attention to to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible and as Jonathan was indicating uh, a little bit earlier getting paid is a really good thing it's just it's just a, a gift until you actually get paid for it right and so uh managing the payments and uh financing and all of that that uh, uh Michelle is going to cover it's just critically important to the success of any company uh, wanting to to do exporting and if we could go to the next one okay so uh michelle Rem uh, remerscheid uh is with our vest and uh she's the uh, sales person and leader of the international trade finance uh part for uh the arkansas um i'm sorry for the uh, uh arkansas our 
uh, office. And I think, uh, Michelle, you're, you're actually located in uh, northwest Arkansas, if I, if I remember correctly. But uh, she has uh, a fantastic background in, in uh, financial matters and uh, has been with the District Export Council now for about uh, six months or so. And uh, their office is actually over both Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri. And uh, she's going to be covering this uh, session today, having to do with making sure that you get paid and what the financial programs are out there that you uh, can use to uh, to get paid and to actually finance exports. So, uh, Ms. Michelle, if you would uh, take it away, would appreciate it. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. All right, are you seeing the blue R vest? Or better yet, are you seeing? Yeah, there, there, there we go. My title slide. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone. You can tell that we've all been uh, working together for a while because Jonathan, you stole some words right out of my mouth, and now you too, Rudy. So y'all will hear a little bit of repetitiveness. And yes, I'm originally from Texas, so I apologize for that, y'all. Um, unless you appreciated that, then you're welcome. Um, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Michelle Remerscheid. I am the International Business Development Advisor here at Arvest Bank. Um, I cover the entire state of Arkansas, as well as parts of Oklahoma, Missouri, though the vast majority um, of those areas are covered by my counterpart, Randy Kellogg. So happy to be here today to discuss managing payments and finances from an exporting lens. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, with any questions during the presentation. Um, honestly, not 100% sure where it will pop up. So um, if you do put something in the chat and I miss it, I also have to have a little ring light because it gets a little dark and I'm honestly just now seeing the chat button is underneath there. So I probably will miss it. Just feel free to give a little shout Happy to answer any questions. Um, I will be stopping periodically throughout the presentation to ask for questions as well, if you prefer to wait. Um, and then of course, at the end as well. So as I mentioned, today is our last day in this series um, and I will be discussing payments and financing, but wanna give a shout out to those who went before me, Ed King, Sam Rothschild, William Burgess, Natalie Kennedy and Graham Catlett. They are all amazing individuals, very thankful for their leadership and their expertise. And if you missed any of these great presentations thus far, they are available on our YouTube channel. Um, Ms. Heidi does a great job of sending a follow-up email that summarizes the presentations and has that link as well. Um, this is also being recorded and will be presented on our YouTube channel. So if you have to leave early, something comes up, no worries, you won't miss anything. So let's go ahead and get started. This presentation is designed to provide a broad explanation of payment and risk mitigation as well as trade finance strategies and best practices. If there is one thing that I'd like you to take away from this presentation, it is that planning on the front end will bring you success on the back end. We like to call that pre-planning here at Arvest and pre-planning will allow both parties to be more comfortable with the trade and reap better results for everyone. So you may be asking yourself, what makes this so important? I've already made sales after all. Maybe they weren't international, but they were domestic. I feel like I know what I'm doing. Well, having different payment and financing options ultimately makes you more competitive and it provides bonus points in the sense that you'll also appear more sophisticated and experienced, even if you do still feel a little bit shaky um, and are new to the overall experience. So my boss likes to compare a sale to dating to marry. When you're first approaching a sale or an individual, you wanna get a feel for them, do your research, if you will, go on a few dates. And it is our hope that with this presentation, we will arm you with the, confident for the, the confidence for those first few dates, and you will feel a better position to develop an export financing and risk mitigation strategy, as well as a strategy to access working capital so that when you are ready to propose, they'll say yes. So breaking down the sections that we'll be discussing during today's session, we'll specifically be covering international payment methods, trade credit insurance, working capital financing programs, and foreign exchange markets. The bulk of the presentation will be over payment methods, our international payment methods, so bear with me, we will get through it. 
Uh, but before we get into the thick of it, I feel like it's important to level set on where exactly payments and financing takes place in the entire trade negotiation process. So you've probably seen this slide quite a bit, uh, perhaps in every presentation we've had so far, but just want to reiterate that this is the life cycle of the exporting process. And as you see, finance comes towards the end, but don't let that take away from the importance of it. The entire cycle is important. So I hope you retained all that great information that's been presented by the individuals I mentioned earlier. If not, check out our YouTube. Uh, but going back to the dating to marry metaphor, I think we can all agree that when you're thinking of marrying someone, you want to make sure you have a strong relationship or foundation and you have similar lifelong goals um, or plans. But you also want to make sure that you're both getting what you want out of that relationship and not one individual is benefiting while the other is suffering. That's where payments and financing comes into play uh, with this courtship. As one of my bosses has said, and like Rudy just said, um, a sale is a just a gift until you get paid. So let's make sure your payments and financing and your relationships are strong and both parties are mutual benefiting from the sale um, or marriage. So on that note of developing relationships, I wanna take a moment to point out that they really go hand in hand with managing payments and finance. And that's why we illustrate the connection between the two on this slide. There's a level of trust that goes into payment terms and financing, which we'll get into in later slides. So while it takes some time, and you could even say it's difficult, to build trust and form these relationships, it doesn't take much to lose them. So that's why payment methods are so important. Um, and I have to give the District Export Council a plug because they really, really, really can help with developing those meaningful relationships. So getting paid and managing risk. When managing your risk and getting paid, it's crucial to understand your baseline. When do you need the money? What is your risk tolerance? It's also equally important to understand the buyer's baseline. Again, we're dating, we're getting to know them. Where are they coming from? Can they pay? Will they pay? What is customary for our industries? You can't build a strong trade if you're unaware of where you and the buyer currently stand. In addition to what is listed on the slide here, it's also important to decide when the risk of damage to the goods will pass from the seller to the buyer and who will cover the cost of carriage. This is defined within eco terms, which are key, and we'll go over eco terms a little more when we discuss the life cycle of letters of credit a little later on. So there are a variety of different methods of payment. Um, and as you can see on the right-hand side of the triangle indicated by the black arrow, some are more advantageous for buyers or import importers, while others are more advantageous to you, the exporter. While cash in advance is most ideal from your perspective and as an exporter, keep in mind that as an importer, they're hoping for an open account most times. Um, especially with new relationships, it's important to meet in the middle as you develop it, trust and those strong relationships. I wanted to touch specifically on a confirmed letter of credit, the yellow box there towards the top, because while it is an option, you are unlikely to use it. Um, a confirmed letter of credit, if you're not familiar, um, is the layering on a second U.S. bank's promise to pay in addition to your buyer's local bank's promise to pay. You know, that was a mouthful. Um, if you speak with us in our international department, we'll often tell you that a confirmed letter of credit is not worth the cost because they are there are only a few countries with political or solvency concerns strong enough to warrant was it what is essentially a second locally issued letter of credit. However, there are some countries like Argentina and Venezuela that rank among the most impacted by US dollar availability. Um, and in those countries, we do recommend seeking a confirmed letter of credit. So it is an option. You may or may not use it. Uh, so we won't focus on it too much, but did want to point that out. Following cash in advance in confirmed letters of credit, we have letters of credit, documentary collections, or you might have heard documents against acceptance, documents against payment, um, and open accounts. So we'll dive into all of these options a little bit more in depth a little later on. Focusing on cash in advance first, it is a commonly used payment method, 
Um, but it can be difficult to get buyers to accept this method, especially early on in the relationship. We do, however, highly recommend cash in advance if you have a customized product that would be difficult for you to sell uh, to someone else, or um, if it is a, well, difficult to sell to someone else if it happens to fall through. So if I'm selling stuff that says Michelle Remerscheid is the best, it would probably be hard to find other people that would want to purchase that outside of. That being said, if you do have a highly customized product and are seeking a larger dollar amount, so super customized, but also really expensive, making them a little bit uncomfortable with fully cash in advance, um, we do have advanced payments uh, to assist in your pre-export working capital needs. So it is possible to offer the buyer an advance payment bank guarantee so that should you not perform for whatever reason, they could have their advance payment returned by your bank. Um, our banking inst institution issues these frequently in the Middle East and in Asia, but they are common and available worldwide. I also want to provide some additional context on the third bullet here. You might be wondering what a poor credit rating would be. We advise uh, we advise you that anyone who has a credit grade rating of C or lower, if you look at the S&P specifically, it'll say CCC. Um, this is countries like Argentina or Tunisia uh, that have speculative credit that you should try to get cash in advance. Um, I like using the website tradingeconomics.com to confirm that credit grade rating um, of various countries, but there's a variety of resources out there that you can use as well. So ultimately, you don't want to limit everyone to cash in advance as requiring cash in advance can reduce your competitive advantage in markets where your competitors are providing more favorable payment terms already. So additionally, buyers will seek smaller invoice sizes when you are asking for cash in advance, less risk for them. They may also want to increase their order size, but they're limited to how much cash they can let go of up front. So let their bank determine how much they can order from you. I also want to discuss accepting credit card payments uh, with cash in advance. As mentioned on this slide, there are risks. Uh, so when should you use caution? While we don't recommend accepting credit cards for any larger invoices, I would say around $5,000 is a good cutoff. But of course, that is based on your risk appetite. And again, we also don't recommend accepting credit cards for customized goods because you can't resell it. Um, and it's common to pay with credit card for small e-commerce e items. So totally normal there, but highly customized. And to be honest, it's, it's not as secure, but we'll get into that. Uh, so for best practices, we recommend partnering with a strong merchant services company who can provide you insights into your client base in monthly sales. And if you're not familiar, merchant services are often labeled as credit card processing companies. If you're not sure where to get started from there, if you're totally new, this is all brand new to you. I did see like just before this presentation, Forbes posted a pretty good article about the top merchant services company. So feel free to pop over there if you wanna get some advice. But last but not least, payments received via credit card, as I mentioned, are not as safe as payments via wire. Probably heard of wires, they are the most reliable way of payment. Um, credit card payments simply are not immediately available. So keep that in mind when accepting those. On to letters of credit, my personal favorite, and this is also where it tends to get a little bit heavy. So before I dive into this, any questions? Our eyes glazed over. Are we following along. Yeah, um, uh, Michelle, you you might have covered it, and perhaps I just missed it. Uh, what is what is the issue with taking a, a credit card? I mean, is is there a problem? with uh, taking a credit card? What, what's the potential problem? Yeah, so I didn't specifically speak to it, so good question. Um, I did mention that they're not immediately available. It is kind of pending. And if you think about it from a personal perspective, I know at least for me, I've had things be canceled via credit card, or maybe there was a fraudulent charge and the bank declined it. It just, it's not as secure as a wire. Um, think of it as like a pending transaction. So kind of like how a sale is a gift until you get paid. Sure, you can get paid via credit card, but until those funds are in your account, you don't truly have them. So just a little bit more risky. Thank you. 
Yeah, good question. Okay, I will go ahead and move forward then. So if you have um, or subscribe to our DEC newsletter, left newsletter, sorry, you may have seen in our March article, I wrote something about letters of credit. Are they a friend or are they a foe? Business owners have a lot of opinions on letters of credit, so let's talk about it. What is a letter of credit to start? A letter of credit from an exporter's lens is your foreign buyer's bank's promise to pay if you fulfill the underlying sales contract. The bank will underwrite the buyer, it secures your payment, and it increases your competitiveness among others in your market. The main takeaway for letters of credit are that they act as a mechanism of payment and secure the transaction. So the main mechanism for that payment. Letters of credit are also customizable and have different options like what is listed on the slide. They can be site drafts, which means the advising or negotiating bank pays you, the exporter, immediately, or time draft, where the exporter provides credit terms to the buyer. We already touched on confirmed versus regular or advising letters of credit in the earlier slides, but to recap, a confirmation means that the U.S. bank or the confirming bank has added its promise to that of the foreign bank or the issuing bank to pay the exporter. If a letter of credit is not confirmed, it is advised through a U.S. bank, and thus the document is called an advised letter of credit. Letters of credit also utilize the credit rating of the bank as opposed to the credit rating of the customer. Letters of credit are a little bit complicated. Um, as you'll see on the next slide, we'll make it through, I promise. So it's extremely important to have a key banking partner to assist you. So I've mentioned it. What does the process look like? There's a lot on this slide. We will walk through it. Trust me. So first, I want to identify all the parties in the process. On the bottom right-hand side, we have you, the exporter. This little gray, sad-looking building here, honestly. We should do something a little more lively. You may also hear the terms uh, beneficiary and, of course, seller. Just above the exporter, we have the advising and confirming bank here. Uh, that's your bank, and you, the exporter, are working with them. I also want to point out the advising confirming bank might be any bank that the issuing bank has a relationship with in the United States, but that doesn't mean that the bank that advises the letter of credit to you has to be used in demanding payments under the letter of credit. So what are we talking about? An example, we have a client that was working with the National Bank of Egypt, who we didn't have a relationship with. In this situation, the National Bank of Egypt sends the letter of credit to a bank they do have a relationship with, like Bank of America. And Bank of America may send the letter of credit direct to the client or may send it to the client's advising bank. So here, oh, I'm doing this. My screen's over here, but you can't see that. So here are the main parties for you as the exporter. On the bottom left-hand side, we have the importer or your buyer. For the letter of credit process, they are referred to as the applicant. Just above the importer is the foreign buyer buyer's bank, mouthful, referred to as the issuing or opening bank. They are the issuing bank because the importer makes application to them and they issue the letter of credit. And of course, we have the little icons like the plane and the ship to demonstrate the shipping of goods. So all familiar with the little demographics here. And of course, the cash to demonstrate the cash flow. So step one, where do we start? I helped you out here with a little star. Really what we do is we follow the blue and then the yellow and then the green, but I'll talk you through it. So the letter of credit process begins with the contract between the buyer or importer and seller, exporter, yourself, agreeing to pay a stated amount provided certain conditions are met. This is indicated with the darker blue arrow uh, going between the importer and the exporter. At this point in the process, it is very important to select your INCO terms up front so you're aware of when the risk transfers from you to the seller um, and the buyer to the importer. So this is the second time I've mentioned INCO terms. So what are they? Hopefully you're familiar. If you've been with us on this presentation, this shouldn't be new to you, but INCO terms are rules that define important responsibilities of buyers and sellers for the delivery of goods under sales contracts. They are the authoritative rules for determining how cost and risk are allocated to the parties. 
Inco terms are regularly incorporated into contracts for the sale of goods worldwide. You've probably heard of two frequently used terms, FOB or free on board, or CIF or cost insurance and freight. These are two frequently used and honestly misused um, Inco terms, which creates risk for both parties. So it's very important that you work with someone experienced in Inco terms. You should also note that most people are still using 2010 Inco terms rather than 2020. So you should confirm in these conversations as well, you know, I understand this one, but just to be sure, are you referencing 2010 or 2020? Not a ton of changes between the two, but you just wanna be sure. We're talking about managing payments as well as risk. So once that contract is in place, the buyer or importer makes application with the issuing bank right here. It's extraordinarily important for the buyer or importer to request a copy of the draft prior to issuance so that they can then pass that on to you. At this point, your banker and or freight forwarder can then advise you on any issues that may be inherent in the letter of credit draft, anything that we need to adjust, change, add, remove completely. The reviewing of the draft by all parties allows you to avoid any expensive amendment cost prior to the issuance. The issuing bank, once that's all set, signed, delivered, sends the letter of credit to your bank or the advising bank who then forwards it to you. There we go, here's you. Uh, at this point, oh, sorry. Only at this point should you transport the goods um, to the importer. You never, ever, ever, I wanna emphasize this. I stumbled over my words a little bit. You never, ever, ever wanna send any goods prior to receiving the issued letter of credit. Why? There is no guarantee that you will be paid with a letter of credit transaction if it's not in place prior to sending the goods. So you've got the letter of credit. We followed the blue lines. Now you can send the goods to the importer or the buyer. At that point, once you've received that letter of credit, again, you wanna make sure you have the letter of credit first. You send the goods and then the documents right here to your advising bank. Documents, if you're not familiar, what do those include? Usually the invoice, the packing list, the bill of lading, certificate of origin, really anything required to clear goods for customs. Occasionally there is an inspection certification uh, or beneficiary statements that are required as well. So once you send those documents through your advising or confirming bank, the last and final piece is that once the buyer receives the documents, they then send the payment through the advising bank to you. So we have the blue, the yellow, and the green. Again, I know it's a lot, but we made it through. So now that we know the process of the letter, letters of credit, at a high level, what are the benefits? So for you as an exporter, the benefits of using a letter of credit can be summarized as the benefit of having a bank underwriting the buyer, you're able to secure your payment, assuming the documents are in order, and you're able to in increase your competitiveness with enhanced payment terms. As far as the importer or your buyer, they can be reassured that the goods that have been shipped are in order and what they're expecting and that they don't have to pay until it's out of the exporter's control. For example, I have a client who did not use a letter of credit uh, with a new client that they were working with. They did not have a relationship, brand new situation for them. Um, and they paid cash in advance. Two years went by with no update, no communication at all. And keep in mind, he paid cash in advance. That money was long gone. Eventually, he got a shipment out of the blue. And guess what? It was not what he even ordered. They threw in a completely different product uh, than what he expected and what he paid for. Luckily, he was able to pivot his approach. Uh, two years had gone by. His business looked a little bit different at that point. So he was able to make do with what he had um, and it turned out okay. But this is a rare example of it turning out okay. And this is why letters of credit are so important. So you can ensure that you get the product that you paid for and that it's the correct product. So moving on to our third option on our triangle of risk or benefits, if you will, we have documentary collections. With a documentary collection, you are relying on the credit of the buyer and not the buyer's bank as you would with a letter of credit. 
Documenting collections also have the benefit of having both the buyer's bank and the seller's bank involved in the transfer of payment and shipping documents. For exporters, documentary collections are really only an appropriate payment term if you are shipping your goods via ocean, because the main control in the transaction is the original bill of lading, which shows ownership of the goods and is required at port to pick up the goods. So you can think of documentary collections as light or diet letters of credit. Sometimes they are referred to as DP or documents against payment or payments against document. Pretty much uh, you give me the payment and I'll give you the documents that you need to pick up the supplies. Documentary collections are advantageous over letters of credit because they are lower costing. Uh, they are safer than open accounts. Um, and of course there's no credit component. So for that reason, they might be a little bit more advantageous to your buyer. And for our last payment option, the least advantageous for you as the exporter and most advantageous for your buyers, uh, open accounts. <laughs> open accounts are widely used internationally when two trading partners have an existing relationship and essentially trust each other to complete their transaction obligations. But we do not recommend using open accounts as an exporter unless your receivables are properly insured, which we will discuss in just a bit. Uh, the reason being is without credit insurance, there is no guarantee you will get paid. Remember, like Rudy said, a sale is just a gift until you get paid. Open accounts are certainly advantageous for buyers, but very, very risky for sellers like yourself. There's no guarantee of payment, so strongly caution you against that. Summarizing all the international payment methods. Again, this was the bulk of our presentation. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, honestly, the best practice is to be proactive. Take control of the transaction. Decide what your best alternatives are and prioritize them. Maybe you really want letters of credit. If they're not willing to do that, what are your other alternatives that you'd be willing to meet them in the middle? Be clear, name that payment method, name what works best for you as the basis for the transaction. When thinking of letters of credit, use a letter of instruction um, and request a specimen or draft copy of that letter of credit prior to issuance. Trust me, this will save you a lot of headaches. Uh, documentary collections, check out the collecting bank before shipment. We have uh, an OFAC department here at Arvest, Office of Foreign Asset Control. We check out all the parties, so make sure you do your due diligence as well. And last but not least, request a review from both your banker and the freight forwarder prior to shipment. Again, pre-planning, be proactive. You wanna check all of your documents across all your T's and all of your I's. So that was international payment methods. We'll move on to trade credit insurance unless there are any questions. Okay. Now we mentioned trade credit insurance when discussing open accounts, a way to kind of secure it if that is your option. So let's get into it. Credit insurance is insurance that protects business to business accounts receivable against non-payment or bankruptcy or slow pay. It also affords political risk protection on export receivables or insurance that protects against payment default on your export receivables. There are quite a few considerations when deciding to obtain export receivables credit insurance. First, you'll need to speak with a good broker uh, who can support the documentation required to make sure you comply with the insurance company's requirements. You'll also need to make sure your buyer is insurable. Um, if they aren't already on the list, allow for a lead time of eight to 12 weeks for the insurance company to underwrite the buyers. Credit insurance is still important, even if you have general ledger experience, you wanna provide extended payment terms. Or if you wanna provide those extended payment terms, forgot the if there. Credit insurance can help mitigate risk resulting from both commercial and political risk, like what is listed on the slide. It protects against catastrophic loss, makes it safe to increase sales to existing clients, safe to sell to new clients, both domestically and internationally, safer to offer open terms to a new foreign market, uh, enhancement of your borrowing base, like foreign receivables, accounts receivable concentrations, or higher advance rates. We've listed some underwriters on the screen, but I wanted to call out two in particular, Exim Bank and ARI Global. 
XM Bank is the official export credit agency of the United States federal government. Here in Arkansas, um, Oklahoma too, actually, Michael DeWiggins is our contact and he is fantastic. James Clark with ARI Global, which is Accounts Receivable Insurance Global, is our contact for ARI Global and he is also a member of the deck. So if you need an introduction to either of the two, please let any of us know and we'd be happy to help you. So that was our quick overview of trade credit insurance. Now that we've touched on that, I'll move on to working capital financing programs. So on the screen here, we have some data. Um, it is from a study that's a few years old, but it's still accurate for our working capital cycles and still relevant today. So what are we looking at here? U.S. exports are in excess of $1 trillion, with 81% of those being in open accounts. So if you're dealing with an open account, what does that mean for you? As you can see here, the average day of sales outstanding is about 68 days. It's important to note that those 68 days when that receivable is outstanding, you don't have that cash. However, some banks will lend on insured international receivables. So that is an option for you, but that's a long time to go without being paid and can be a huge problem for businesses that are just starting up. So let's talk a little bit more about working capital loans and how that can benefit you. How do you access these to start? How do you access the working capital loans? Well, you need to be bankable, but what does being bankable even means? It means that a business is able to receive some form of traditional financing package from a bank. Things that are taken into consideration are personal credit score, the time in business, your profitability, your debt service coverage, and collateral. But not all of those need to be in perfect order to achieve financing. Using the banking institution of your preference for things like deposits, treasury management, credit cards will help that bank become more familiar with your credibility. One of the biggest favors a business can do for itself is to have accurate and up-to-date financial, financial reporting or bookkeeping. If you are highly skilled in your industry, but not in finance, numbers confuse you, scare you, or I don't wanna say numbers, but finance scares you, that's totally fine. You are not alone. We would recommend hiring out. That is gonna be your key to being bankable, to have all of that in line. So. Keep doing what you do best and leave the finance management to the professionals if you need to. All right, so on this slide, you have some more data um, displaying some more statistics about working capital. I won't read it all to you, but what is our takeaway from this as well as the previous data? A lot of small firms export and a lot of them have major concerns with financing. So how do we overcome this? By being bankable and coming to the table with trade finance options like letters of credit, and documentary collections so you don't have to worry about getting paid or so you can sleep well at night and you have financing to offer to foreign customers. So there are two types of financing that an exporter like yourself would need. The first is working capital for production and pre and post shipment costs like raw materials, inventory, labor, et cetera, and assuring sufficient cash flow while offering competitive terms. All of this is to ensure that you can simply fulfill the export order itself. And second, you need financing for fixed assets, equipment, working capital, debt restructuring to improve your competitive position. Now this is to ensure export success and improve your competitive position to be more efficient. So again, how do we obtain all of this? The Small Business Administration is charged with helping US companies export US goods for economic development with a thought process of hiring more people. And they offer three great export options for you. You may have attended an SBA webinar recently. They do them throughout the year. Um, they've had some ones within the past couple months, I believe as well, and they're all really great. So if so, this shouldn't be new information for you. Um, if you didn't get the pleasure of attending one recently, uh, I'd love to tell you more about how they can support you. So let's first talk about the international trade loan. While not typically used as much as the other two options, the international trade loan is basically a term loan that is usually project specific. It offers a 90% guarantee to lenders on loans up to $5 million, which allow you to utilize your cash and other collateral to continue growing your business. 
you can also get insurance for up to 95% of the invoice. So as with every other SBA loan out there, there is going to be a bank involved. So we recommend that you find a strong bank that has plenty of SBA experience. The second option here is the Export Working Capital Program, EWCP. And the Export Working Capital Program is utilized for access to cash so that you can fulfill orders being placed by international buyers. This is for all your export working capital needs and is really advisable for more seasoned exporters. Same thing as the international loan, the SBA offers a 90% guarantee of up to 5 million. And for more information on the Export Working Capital Program and really any of their loans, you can find that more information on sba.gov. And the third and final program I wanna to touch on today is Export Express. Export Express is one of our favorites. It's a really fantastic program that we often recommend. It can be used either in a term fashion or a working capital fashion. And the Export Express can offer longer terms, credit line options, and loan guarantee options. And it can be used for both domestic and foreign transactions. If you're considering any loans from the SBA, you may wanna ask your bank if they are a SBA preferred lender, which makes the process a little simpler since they know your banking habits already. Lending decisions are made in-house, making it faster and more efficient than some other options. Export Express is ideal for export promotion and development needs like website translation and localization, trade shows, foreign marketing activities, traveling to meet with foreign buyers, and speaking of export promotion, myself or any other member of the deck can introduce you to the amazing people at the Arkansas World Trade Center. Everybody there is a subject matter expert when it comes to different territories and are instrumental to exporting. They can also introduce you to different grants to help offset some costs of establishing business internationally as well. And Michelle, here's a, probably a good time for me to, to make a comment. Uh, you know, here's the reality. If you ask just about every bank whether they do SBA loans, uh, they will, will almost certainly tell you that they do. But here's the reality. There, there's only about four or five banks that really do the overwhelming bulk of, of SBA lending. And, uh, you know, so... Whenever, whenever you're looking at uh, going to your bank and helping you with some of these things, make sure that that it is a bank that, in fact, does do, has been doing uh, uh, large quantities of SBA lending because they will have the personnel, the expertise, and you know all, all the the uh, knowledge they need to be able to help you with this. And so, once again, there's there's only four maybe five banks in the state of Arkansas that that do uh, quite a bit of of, of lending, uh, of SBA lending. So just know, know who you're banking with. Yep, absolutely. Uh, same thing goes for international expertise. They might say, yeah, yeah, we can help you out, but they might not have that experience and that could be detrimental. Good plug. Any other questions? I really only have a few more slides um, and then we'll be done and we can do the wheel of prizes, I want to call it. Uh, but uh, any questions before we move on? Cool. So thank you for bearing with me. I know it's a lot of information. We'll touch on foreign exchange markets um, and then some frequently asked questions. I don't want to speak to this too much, uh, but really just want to say we know it's more ideal and easiest to perform trades in USD. But by leveraging foreign exchange, you can have a competitive advantage over your domestic competitors. It makes it easier for them and therefore more appealing for them. If you can dual invoice and allow your clients to pay in their currency, it makes their business easier and your business more appealing. There are a variety of different ways to protect yourself against currency fluctuations should you decide to accept foreign currency, uh, foreign currency exchange markets, uh, or Foreign exchange markets and fluctuations can affect your business, so it's important that you have a conversation with a foreign currency provider, um, someone like your bank or a foreign currency hedging provider before, before, before you quote in foreign currency. So I won't read off all the frequently asked questions on the screen here, but I wanted to provide you with a list of some of the questions we've received. That way, if you're sitting here soaking it all in, you're not sure where to go, 
you're not alone. These are a lot of our commonly asked questions. Who do I talk to first? Uh, what is political risk? What is commercial risk? Can I finance my insured receivables with a bank? The answer to all these questions, talk to your international banker, preferably. Uh, one with actual international experience that can guide you um, and has expertise. One that has um, specific expertise with international trade. And if you do not have a well-equipped banker with international expertise, we would recommend any attorney or CPA with international experience. Really the key here is that international experience. Um, lots of people say, sure, we can help you with letters of credit, but that might just be domestic. They might not have experience with international letters of credit. And that is a whole other beast. So Absolutely. really make sure you do your due diligence um, and you find out the right resources for you. And if you're not sure where to go, We've got a lot of great resources that we can hook you up with. Partnerships are key. Um, always lots of questions. We're always happy to help. Uh, local bankers, freight forwarders, all of us, we're here to help you succeed. Of course, the U.S. Department of Commerce, District Export Council, World Trade Center, everyone listed on this slide is happy to help guide you because if you succeed, Arkansas succeeds. So Absolutely. I will turn it over for questions one more time before I turn it over to you, Rudy. Yes, yes. And, and I want to highlight for everyone that, that Reggie uh, Harley, who's the export finance manager uh, at the Office of International Trade, uh, has put up his contact information uh, in the chat box. So do be aware of that. You might want to take a picture of that just so that you have uh, all that all that information. But, uh, you know, and one of the things that, that Reggie said uh, uh, was that even if a bank does SBA loans, they may not have the authority to do EWCP or Export Express. So that's that's really the relevant question is how much experience does the bank have in doing those programs? And, and once again, uh, my, my experience has been that they all say they they do SBA loans and, and do international, but uh, the reality is that that there's only a, literally a handful of banks that have the expertise and the uh, the withdrawal to, to to do it and do it often. So just really, really important. Yeah, the, uh, the term that you want to ask for is a preferred lender. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that makes things a lot easier, as, as Michelle said, because uh, as a preferred lender, the, the bank acts at, at almost as if they were the SBA. Uh, they don't have to go out and get uh, approval or anything like that. They already have automatic authority. So th I think that's just uh, a real shortcut and a really key thing to to be able to to uh, work with a bank that has that that kind of uh, experience and and that kind of authority. I don't. Uh, uh, does does anyone have any questions? When you know, once again, feel free to, uh, to unmute and ask the question. Or if you want to continue using the chat, that's that's okay too. Um, I do. And and first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Michelle and, and Rudy. Such an excellent presentation. As a quick introduction, uh, my name is Dell Elyria. Jonathan was very gracious to. Um, we met Jonathan yesterday. Actually, Jonathan and I have been dialoguing for a minute, but. Um, we're coming late into the game, into this presentation, and what great information that you've shared with us. Um, just a quick uh, update for you all um, as an introduction. My wife started a minority-owned business company, um, and um, we have had a tremendous experience um, cutting our teeth in the industry working for Walmart since 1994. So we're trying to leverage our experience to um, working in both the vendor world and at Walmart to formulate partnerships um, in Asia to um, in the short term, Michelle and Rudy, to to start, you know, finding goods and services that, you know, um, that we can bring to Walmart Inc. Uh, that's Walmart Inc. and Sam's Club. But in the long term, because we I think Jonathan had uh, introduced his um, what his um, um, role in the company or in your partnership is to to create jobs for Arkansas because absolutely you know, my, met my wife here at University of Arkansas. Um, I myself went to University of Florida, but Arkansas is our home. Our kids were born here, so um, I think our dreams kind of intersect, and 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 we look forward to to learning more from you. But as a sorry for that long intro, Michelle, but I did have a couple of quick questions for you. Yeah. 
I made notes of letter, uh, the different instruments in play, whether letter of credit, uh, documentary, uh, collections, and open account. And one of the things that piqued my attention was um, you talked about cost. Um, mm -hmm. One, because we are an upstart company, um, mm -hmm. we're trying to, you know, try to do things in the right way and be financially prudent. Can you share a little bit uh, the cost differences between uh, letter credit and, and documentary collections? Yeah, so it depends on the invoice size. It also depends on what the terms are extended. Is it gonna be six weeks, two months, three months? Uh, those are the main drivers of what influences cost. Um, really, it, it varies so much. It's hard for me. I couldn't really give you um, a number if you want. We can talk offline and I can tell yeah. you what we would typically charge here at Arvest, but because there's no credit component for documentary collections, I, it's more of a, a set fee, whereas letters of credit do vary dependent on the terms and dependent on the invoice size. So um, don't want to give any quotes on here. I made that mistake. No, no, absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Let me know. And I'm happy just to throw some hypothetical numbers at you. That way you can at least know, you know what we work with. But I will say generally within the industry, there's not a ton um, of variance. We've our prices have remained the same since we established our international department, but that might not always be the case. Really, just kind of like what we've been harping on. Just make sure you find someone who actually is experienced um, with international trade is probably the main thing. But, anyways, long story. I'll send you some numbers. I'll work with Jonathan. Um, just give you some examples. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things, that, yeah, one of the things that I really want to kind of highlight for you because you know, obviously, uh, Michelle covered uh, a lot of information. You know, th this uh, list of different, uh, you know, letters of credit, uh, documentary, uh, cash, uh, you know, uh, open account. Uh, it, it's about about risk. You know, who, who's bearing the risk, and so uh, a lot of that has to. Yes, to, thanks for the for the slide. Uh, a lot of it has to do with you know. Uh, what, what's your appetite for risk, number one? And and also, probably, uh, on a more practical perspective, you know, how well do you know those people? I mean, obviously, uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, like Michelle was saying, sort of like dating, right? Uh, you, you might start off with cash in advance. If, in fact, if it's something that's, you know, really risky and, and uh, it's very customized and whatnot. And then over time, you might wind up kind of going down that ladder, right? Uh, well, you know, we've been doing business with you for six months and everything's been going well. Maybe we can do uh, confirmed letters of credit or letter of credit. And then, you know, uh, maybe a couple of years uh, pass by and things are going sweet. And, and so, you know, you start trusting that person more and more. And then maybe at some point you, you, you give them open accounts, but, you know, going straight to open account, is not a good idea. Uh, and because the risk is all to you, uh, and cash in advance is kind of risky for the, you know, for the, on the other side. So it's a matter of, of risk mitigation. This, this whole idea of method of payments is about risk mitigation. And uh, I, I will tell you that, um, and I think Michelle will, will verify this, the, the difference between letters of credit and document, uh, documentary collection is, is not uh, big at all. Uh, but what's really important here is the risk mitigation and it's like letters of credit. Uh, it's just a tremendous tool at a very, very cheap cost, you know, versus the, the risk. And, and so certainly a, a very viable tool. And once again, just, uh, you have to consider what the risk is and what the, you know, is it customized, not customized, uh, and are, would you be able to resell it on and on and on? So it, it's something that you guys have to really take into consideration. And the cost of the letter of credit versus documentary collection is a really small one and certainly uh, in terms of the risk. Thanks for weighing in, Rudy. I appreciate the insight. And, and I completely understand, Michelle. Um, I think it, it is probably most appropriate that I sidebar with you. I saw your email at the beginning of the presentation. So I'll reach out to you, um, you know, shortly after the presentation. And again, thank you for introducing us to the different levers out there that's available. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts or questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Hi, Rudy. This is Eddie Sumar. Thank you for, for this presentation. And Michelle, this is great. But also for Dell, uh, I worked in trade finance many years ago. I like the metaphor that Michelle used. It's a marriage. 
even when you are looking for a bank, make sure that you have a great relationship with that bank because fees are going to be a fact of my relationship with the bank. So the more you know the bank, the more relationship built, then they'll give you preferred uh, uh, fees on documentary collection. They can guide you through the letters of credit, the pitfalls and so forth. Because when I worked for a company, we had a great relationship with the bank and their, their LC department was amazing. They directed us, made sure that we got paid. If there is any discrepancy, they fixed it. When I did documentary collection through them, they gave me the preferred rate. So really, it's a marriage not only with the customer, but it's a marriage with the bank too. Thank you, Eddie. That's great, uh, great comment. Let's see here. I see. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, let me go ahead and also, while I'm, so, so I don't forget, uh, uh, we've just recently added a an, another uh, webinar that we're going to put on on the 29th of March, uh, having to do with uh, export documents. Uh, you know, that is such a critical issue. And we thought it would be a nice follow up to uh, this series of classes. And uh, that uh, that class will occur on the 29th, which is a Wednesday at 2 p.m., just like this class was at 2 p.m. Central. And uh, uh, Ms. Heidi, if, if you want to throw that uh, slide up, if you can. Looks like she's trying. All righty. Well, mm -hmm. technology is wonderful until it doesn't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is it coming? Yeah, it looks like it's coming. <laughs> okay, it's probably less time. Well, the link is in the chat. Okay. The link is in the chat. You're right, right. That's what prompted prompted me to uh, to uh, comment on it. But uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, it, th th this particular class that we're describing about uh, export documentation is not part of the series, but it's just another class. And uh, I think it, would, but I think it just feeds into what we've been learning and uh, and covers uh, all the pitfalls of uh, not doing the documentation correctly. That's uh, a key thing. So, uh, Ms. Heidi, let's go ahead and, and move on to the to the next thing, the next important thing. <laughs> this is the most important thing. This is yeah. the moment you've been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you guys may remember that uh, for those of you who have been through all the classes, um, we're we're doing a drawing of, of a book uh, that, that that I think is really really relevant, and um, we said that. You'd have to be present to win, so that's a good thing. And uh, uh, okay. I so I say, is it spinning now? I mean, is it? Uh, no, it's not spinning yet. I want to okay. make sure everyone, everyone, check and make sure that if you've been here for the previous five classes or you've watched them, the recording, that your name is on this list before I click spin. Anybody missing? Did I miss anyone? I've been trying to make sure. There's one person that's listed as call-in user, so, and I don't know who that is. <laughs> I think that's Eddie. Yeah, that's uh, me. It, that's uh, me uh, because I uh, I don't have good reception, uh, so okay. I, I called my phone. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, well, I've got you on the list there. Okay, so let's let's see how this goes. Ready, set, go. <laughs> And oh my gosh, it is Look, Muhammad. It, it, uh, is, is he here? Is, is he here? I think so. I saw his name on the list. Oh, okay, great, great. Well, uh, Muhammad, you're going to be the, the winner of the book that you've been seeing now for uh, at least a, a few weeks. And uh, get in touch with us and we'll make arrangements to, to, to get it to you. And uh, so, congratulations on that. Uh, what's the next, Miss Miss Heidi? Um, let's see. Next, we. Oh, my screen is still not coming up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It only happens. Well, it's just. I think that's just our closing screen. Okay. With, with the uh, yeah. Um, with with the uh, uh, contact information. But I will be sure to provide that in the follow-up email. Um, 
Very good. Uh, yeah, so I think you guys know that, of course, we've been recording this, and so it's going to be available before too long, uh, the, the classes along with the other ones. And uh, uh, Heidi will send you a notification letting you know that that it is uh, available and ready to go. And at the same time, she'll send you the, the contact information for uh, myself, uh, for Michelle, and, and for Jonathan, Should you, and also for Heidi as well. Should you have any questions, feel free to to reach out to whoever you think is the the correct uh, and most appropriate person. Ah, there it is. Excellent, oh excellent. And uh, you know, feel free to to contact us, and we'll address whatever concerns or questions you might have. Once again, uh, before we sign off, want to uh, thank Michelle for doing such a fabulous job. Uh, kudos to you, Michelle. You did a great job. And um, also thank you for attending uh, the classes. Now, if some of you uh, kind of came in late uh, on the on the series of classes, feel free to go back to our YouTube channel, uh, you know, review the classes, and uh, uh, we we are going to be presenting to everyone who went through the GYE, the Grow Your Export, six series of classes. And even if they, if you do it after the fact, we're going to be giving you a, a certificate of completion. And um, so that that's something that you'll you'll have. And I think it's a uh, pretty 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 cool. Anyway, uh, I think there was one. Just uh, once again, just a last reminder: 29th of March, 2 p.m. Central Time. We'll be doing the. Um, uh, the uh, documentation, the export documentation class, critically important that you that you have the knowledge base to be able to do these documents correctly. And uh, David Noah, who's uh, the president of Shipping Solutions, uh, will be teaching that class. All right. Well, unless someone has any thoughts or questions, I think we will call it a webinar. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but... Uh... Michelle, you gave that presentation so much better than I ever did. So. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say anything, Jonathan, but. <laughs> uh, so, so well done. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. Miss Heidi, you've done a fantastic job of keeping us organized and on schedule. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. So, Miss Heidi, thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. And again, our partnership with the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions that make all this possible. So thank you all. Please reach out to us with any questions and I uh, hope to see you all soon. All right. Take care.